This is a production of Cornell University. All right. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. It's really, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. It's really great to, to see all of you here. Um, and I'm very excited to, to present my research on root and rhizosphere processes in forest soils uh, today. I'm actually not the first Dutch person to observe roots or study roots. All right, so Vincent van Gogh was way ahead of me. Um, he observed and painted tree roots. And the reason for him that he got so interested in roots is, was because to him, tree roots represented the struggle of life. Well, he wasn't the most optimistic person. Uh, and I would not use roots as a metaphor of my own life or even of my own PhD. But I would argue that roots can really be a struggle to study. They're, they're hidden away in the soil, they're hard to get to, and it's hard to like, observe them under natural conditions. But once you find methods um, or you use older methods to, to study them and learn new things about them, they, they're truly fascinating. And uh, on top of that, they play a very important role in the cycling of carbon and nutrients through our environment. So I would argue that they're definitely, studying them is definitely worth the struggle. And uh, I hope you, you agree with me. So the roots that uh, Van Gogh uh, painted here are more woody structural roots. And those are not the roots that, that I was interested in for my dissertation. The roots I was interested in are, are fine roots. So those are really the smallest roots of the root system. We're talking really about the millimeter scale here. And um, these, these roots are also ephemeral, meaning that after a certain period of time, they're shed, um, just like leaves on a tree. But unlike leaves on the tree, their production season and their death season, so to say, are variable. And their lifespan can really vary from a few days up to a few years. This is also the part of the root system um, that's in charge of taking up water and nutrients from the soil. Um, they're the roots that associate with beneficial microorganisms in the soil. Um, and they're also the part of the root system that can quickly respond to changes in the environment. And they can do that by producing roots in uh, more roots in an area of the soil where there's higher nutrient availability or resource availability. Uh, but they can also do this by changing their lifespan. And besides responding to the environment, they also have the ability to modify the soil right around, right around these roots. And so the biological characteristics, the physical characteristics, and the chemical characteristics around the root in the soil are, are very different from, from the rest of the soil. And one of the, re or one of the reasons for this um, is root exudation. So this is the process by which uh, roots release chemicals into the soil. And I will talk more about this, about this in a bit. At the ecosystem scale, fine root growth dynamics are a very important part of the carbon cycle. In fact, mo more than or around 50% of all organic carbon found on land um, is stored in forest. And a big part of that pool um, is found below ground. And so in the context of climate change, one of the big questions is, what is going to happen with this huge pool of carbon stored in forests? And one of the reasons that we, that we don't we aren't able to answer that question yet is because we have a very limited understanding of root soil interactions and how and about how changes in the environment may, may change those interactions. So the aim of my dissertation was to enhance our understanding of root soil interactions in a changing climate and I did this by studying two different components within this system. So the first part of my dissertation is about the effect of drought on fine root production and lifespan. And then the second part of my presentation, or of my dissertation, is about the effect of root exudation on soil organic matter dynamics. And so this is also the way that I will guide you through my talk today. So the first part of my dissertation, um, the effects of drought on, on fine roots, um, actually took place in Germany in collaboration with the Technical University of Munich. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to take advantage of this true fall uh, exclusion infrastructure that has been installed in one of the forests nearby to study um, the response of fine roots to drought at the field scale.
And studying root responses to water resources in the soil is particularly tricky because we expect drought to affect fine root production in different ways. So first of all, um, water resources are going to be more limiting in the soil. And so usually when we think of a plant growing in, in an environment with limiting soil resources, um, the expectation is that the plant would invest more biomass and more carbon below ground to, to forage for those resources and really spend its energy on finding those resources in the soil and taking them up. However, in the, in the scenario of a drought, drought is also going to influence the above ground physiology of the tree. And so one of the main strategies by which trees can uh, minimize water loss is through closing the stomata in the leaf, leaves. But that also means that um, less CO2 can be taken up. And so then we get into a scenario where maybe um, the tree is limited in carbon resources and therefore also has limited resources to spend on root production. So this was kind of, so there, there's really these two different effects that, that take place and it's hard to predict because of that what, what would happen to find root growth dynamics below ground. And so studying the effect of drought um, in temperate forest ecosystems is important because the, the duration, the frequency and severity of drought is, is predicted to go up even in areas where trees are usually not water limited. An additional reason uh, for foresters, and this is, I was working or collaborating with foresters at the Technical University of Munich, is that one of their most economically important trees is Norway spruce. And is this tree species is particularly vulnerable to drought. And this might be partly due to its shallow root system. So all its roots are in the layer of the soil that is gonna dry out the fastest. Um, and these trees are mainly grown in monoculture. So an additional question is like why what, can we, what kind of management strategies could we find to, to mitigate these negative effects of drought on the root system of Norway's spruce? So with this background in mind, um, I tested two hypotheses in this study. The first one being that drought reduces fine root productions but will increase root lifespan. And the rationale behind this was is that the tree will have limited carbon resources to, to build more roots but to compensate for that, the fine roots that are already there are gonna live for longer. My second hypothesis was that mixed species arrangement will buffer the negative effect of drought on fine root production. And to, to further explain why, why I think that's gonna happen, I have a little diagram here. So you can imagine a forest, a monoculture forest of spruce trees on, on, the, on the left. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot of fine roots in that upper layer of the soil and they're going to be competing for those limited resources that are already there. While if you have a forest where there's, forest, uh, where there's spruce trees and beech trees, so that's the other um, species that I studied here, um, there's going to be uh, fewer, the, the, the distribution of roots will be more even and so also resources can be shared more efficiently and more equally, um, more evenly. And in addition, because beech has a deeper root system, there might be other mechanisms by which uh, beech can facilitate the fine root production of spruce, for example, by, by hydraulic lift. So the way that I tested these hypotheses was through a four year long field study at the site of which I already showed a picture. And this, uh, this field site had um, 10 research plots um, that had a species gradient. So as you can see in the diagram in the middle of the plot, you see a mixed zone of both beech and spruce trees. And then on the side, uh, monocultures of beech or spruce. And then half of these plots had full, through fall exclusion roofs were installed on top of them. And so these roofs would close um, if it was raining, but then also, during the winter months, they were also left open. So really the idea was here to study the effect of seasonal, like a summer droughts or a drought during the growing season on fine root production. But we still let uh, some soil moisture be recharged during, during the winter months. And the way that I, I observed the fine roots was by using mineralisotron methods. So you can see a tube here um, that, well, the outside of the tube here, but it goes down to 50 centimeters and the tube is see-through. Um, so then with cameras, we can monitor if any new fine roots are produced or how old the fine roots are that, that are already there. 
Um, and so by, we had to really come back every two weeks to keep on monitoring these routes. Um, and I want to thank um, undergraduate researchers from the Technical University of Munich for this because they were really the one that did this most of the time. Um, and so we had 60 tubes in total, so it's six tubes per plot. And then we would come back, there were 44 pictures per tube. And then we would come back every two weeks for almost, two, for almost four years. So we had a lot, a lot of root pictures to deal with. And um, um, different members of the Mbowerly lab helped me with analyzing all these pictures. Um, so I see Tommy sitting here today. And uh, well, there's a, there's a whole big group and Max even, our lab technician helped. So I wanna also thank all of you for all your help there because I really couldn't have gone through all those pictures by myself. We also had soil moisture sensors installed into the plot so that we could um, double check that these true-fall exclusion roofs were actually doing their job. Um, so this is a graph where we see soil moisture in the upper 10 centimeters of the soils. We also had sensors installed deeper down into the soil. And um, this is soil moisture um, all over the years of the study. And then they're also marked when the roofs were closed versus when they were open. And so the thing that I want you to take away from this graph is that we have um, three red lines, which represent the drought treatment, and three blue lines. And then there were soil moisture sensors in the beach, spruce, and mixed stone. But what I want you to take away from this is that the drought treatment is working. So we get reduced soil moisture when the roofs are closed, but also we can see that even when the roofs are open, soil moisture isn't fully recharged. All right. So the, the first results that I'm sharing with you are on the total amount of fine roots that were produced um, during the four years of this study. And so we have, um, I'm showing here fine root production of beech and spruce and then in the control plot and in the drought plot. And so you can see that drought indeed significantly affected fine root production of spruce and, and slightly of beech. So that's in line with our hypothesis that we thought that drought was going to reduce fine root production. Um, then if we, if we look at the mixed zone of the plot, so this is the total fine root production of both beech and spruce together, we do not see a reduction in fine root production. So that's also in line with what I hypothesized. So then we can also look at fine root production uh, by depth. So here I'm showing you fine root production of spruce and beech in the, in the single species zone of the plot. And so we see that fine root production is reduced in the upper layers, but also in the deeper layers of the soil. So even though in the deeper layers of the soil, soil moisture was higher, um, we still see this reduction, which suggests that the trees indeed may have been carbon limited, so just couldn't produce as many roots as they as they might have under, under more um, ideal conditions. Then if we look at the mixed species zone, uh, we do not see this effect on, of drought on this uh, fine root production of spruce. So at none of the layers, we see a reduction in fine root production, while beech still shows um, a decrease in fine root production from 10 to 20 centimeters soil depth. And so we can, kind of average the results here over those depth layers to kind of um, summarize the results that we see in the mix versus the single species plots. And so we see that beech is equally affected by the drought in, um, in the single and mixed species zone, while spruce is only affected by the drought in the single species zone, but not in the mixed species zone. And so part Part of this um, result for spruce might be explained by looking at the differences in soil moisture between the single species zone of spruce and the mixed species zone. So if you look at um, the soil water content in the drought plots of the mixed species and spruce zone, we see that the soil moisture in the mixed species zone is significantly higher than in the single species zone. So that may explain part of why we see um, that spruce is less affected by the drought in the mix. And 
And so then to end, estimate a fine root lifespan uh, of the roots that I was observing, um, I used um, Cox proportional hazard models and uh, Kaplan-Meier estimates. Um, and what we found for medium lifespan is that uh, both for spruce and beech, drought increased the fine root lifespan um, in both the mix and the single species zone. So that's also in line with if what, what I hypothesized. However, if we then look over these, um, when we look at this over the years, and so a different way to look at a medium lifespan or something that is related to fine root lifespan is um, looking at the hazard ratio. So you can look at the, the risk of death in the drought versus the control plot. And so a uh, hazard ratio less than one in this case means that there's a higher, uh, that there's a lower risk of mortality in the drought plot, while um, a hazard ratio that is higher than one means a higher, a higher risk in the drought plot. So you can see for spruce here that um, throughout the years, its hazard ratio is below one, and the first three years it's also, it's significant. So it seems like its response is quite steady in a way. However, for beech, we only see um, um, a reduced risk of mortality, which would be linked to a longer lifespan in, in the first year of the study. And uh, then for the next few years, it's, that changes. So this suggests that maybe um, for beech, this isn't a sustained uh, strategy um, under repeated episodes of summer drought, or maybe it's, it's, it, it's utilizing other strategies to to deal with this reduced um, soil moisture in the soil or moisture in the soil. So overall, what do these what do these results mean for for carbon cycling in forests? Well, if we have less fine root production and um, the fine roots that are already there are are getting older, that means that there is less there's going to be less fine root turnover, and the rate and amount at which carbon would be transferred into uh, would be transferred to a soil organic matter pool is, is going to decrease. However, it seems that if we look at mixed species arrangements or mixed species forests, that this uh, negative effect of drought may be mitigated to a certain extent. And especially because uh, spruce is the one that is benefiting from, from this mixed species composition, um, it, it seems like this could be a better forest management strategy if foresters want to cultivate Norway spruce um, on their, in a climate where maybe more drought periods are to be expected. All right, that brings me to the second part of, of my dissertation. So in this second part, I, I studied the effect of root exudate chemistry on, on soil carbon cycling. Um, my interest in soil science um, aren't new. Um, I did my master's, like Taryn already said, in soil science with Johannes. Um, but really, my interest in soil go even further back than that. This is me uh, as a child practicing my soil sampling skills. And uh, for everyone that has asked me over the years if we wear clogs or wooden shoes in the Netherlands, we do, and this is the proof for that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing my soil sampling skills and uh, I look a little confused because there's no organic matter in this soil and there's, there's no roots, so what's going on? Because really this area where um, uh, roots and the soil meat is, is, is an area in the soil that I find very interesting. And this interface is, is also called the rhizosphere. And this is really the place where roots interact with, uh, with a diverse community of organisms, of microorganisms, invertebrates, other plant species. Um, and lately, this region of the soil um, has also been labeled as a hotspot of biological activity, meaning that uh, we can observe accelerated rates of carbon and nutrient cycling in this, in this zone. And a recent study showed that, that these rhizosphere processes may be responsible for up to one third of all soil carbon mineralized in forests. And so this, this phenomenon is also called um, root priming. And so, and one of the main, there's, people have proposed 
different mechanisms for why this is happening. But one of the main mechanisms attributes this effect to root exudation. So this, that this idea of roots releasing chemicals into the soil um, that then result in an increase or decrease in soil organic matter decomposition. And so just to explain this hypothesis that's out there in a little bit more detail, uh, we can start with imagining a soil without any roots. And there, so there's a big soil carbon pool and we have some microbes living in that soil that are chewing away on this soil organic matter. And some of the carbon is leaving the system as, as CO2. And then what, what has been commonly hypothesized is what, hap what, what happens when we introduce roots into the system is that roots are exuding label carbon compounds, organic compounds, um, that are easy to break down, that then either increase the activity of the microbes that live there or even the abundance of the microbes, which then results uh, in them also decomposing more of this carbon soil organic matter pool, which then results overall in a, in a larger flux of CO2 leaving the system. And of course, some of this CO2 is coming from the exudates that, were, that are degraded, and some of that is coming from the soil. However, um, my question it was, when I, when I read about this, is this, is this really true? Is this really true for all exudates that are being exuded? Because really, um, so their roots exude a very wide variety of chemicals. And really, the majority of those chemicals we haven't even identified yet. So that's, that's where we start. We don't even know the variety of chemicals that, that is being exuded. And then we also don't know what these, how these different chemicals would affect the soil microbial community. So we don't know that either. And then really, we also don't really know what, what would happen if we see no change at all, an increase or decrease in soil organic matter decomposition. And if you, if you read studies on root priming um, that have been done with different plant species, you indeed find that sometimes um, so microbial respiration is increased, sometimes it's decreased, sometimes there's no effect at all. So we're, we're missing out on a full explanation of, of, of the mechanisms that play a role in this root priming phenomenon. And so one of the reasons why um, I think this, this hypothesis that I just explained or this food resource hypothesis of label, label compounds got so much support is because when these experiments, when their ex experiments were designed to study this phenomenon in the lab, um, mostly glucose was used as a proxy for root exudation. So these were like simple, simple soil incubations where either artificial roots were uh, created, as you can like, as an example I give you on the slides, um, or just compounds were added uh, by pipetting them into the soil. And then um, the effect of glucose on soil carbon cycling was measured. Um, however, like I've already been emphasizing, roots exude a lot of different compounds. And one really large group of compounds that has been largely ignored in these root priming studies are secondary metabolites. Um, and so secondary metabolites are expected to show a higher variation across species, um, but also um, the group of compounds that I thought was important to study have been studied in soils and have been shown to, to have different functions. So not just a food source, but they can in certain cases be, be toxic. They can uh, decrease enzyme activities or inhibit enzyme activities. Um, they, they play a role in plant microbe signaling um, and they can mobilize other resources that might have been immobilized in the soil. So there's, there's a lot of other functions that could be, or a lot of other mechanisms that could be playing a role here. So I, I designed two experiments to really test one hypothesis, which was that root phenolic compounds do not function as a microbial food source, but influence soil carbon cycling through other mechanisms. And so the first experiment that I designed um, started with identifying the exudates of six different tree species. Because if I didn't even know which phenolic compounds were exuded, then how could I test um, their effect? On, on rhizosphere biogeochemistry. And so um, I, I uh, grew tree species in the greenhouse um, on their, in, a, in a medium that didn't contain any organic matter. 
and then I transferred them to hydroponics and eventually that I measured their exudates by um, putting them in individual jars and with cellulose acetate strips I sampled the phenolics from that solution and for this uh, part of my experiment I want to thank Andre Kessler with whom I collaborated a lot and I wasn't it was a struggle in the beginning to, to find a method that was working to work with these phenolics. And I'd also like to thank the rest of his lab for um, helping with HPLC analysis. So then after, um, after I identified these compounds, the next step was to, to test the subset of these on, on soil microbial respiration. So I'd have my control soil and then uh, similar to what other uh, incubation studies that, that we're looking at root priming or priming have done. Um, I added different phenolic compounds to the soil and then measured um, soil microbial respiration using potassium hydroxide traps. Yeah, so about measuring root exudates, I would say this was really the struggle of my PhD. It's, uh, it's very challenging to measure them. Um, you, you're working with very small concentrations, and um, I actually started with um, try. Like I, I, my first idea was to measure root exudation even in the forest in Germany. Um, then I brought it to a smaller scale outside, um, still growing the roots in a, in a potted medium, uh, and uh, try to excavate parts of the root system and like put them in tubes and try to catch the root exudate. But none of this, none of this was working, and that's how. In the end, I ended up um, in the greenhouse uh, with a hydroponic system, but as you can see, I look, uh, I look quite happy. So it worked out in the end. So yeah, so with this, with this method, um, I identified 181 unique root exudates that belong to nine different biosynthetic classes. Um, but out of these 181 exudates, um, I only found five matches with standards that I use. So that just demonstrates really the big diversity of chemicals that, that we haven't identified yet. However, I was able to, for most uh, chemicals, put them into a biosynthetic or assign a biosynthetic class to them. So we did have some extra information. Um, and then I, I wanted to answer this question of um, how unique the, these phenolic profiles were, were to, um, among species. So how species specific they were. So I used an, um, NMDS analysis for that. And so the way that you can interpret this plot is that points that are closer together are more similar and points, data points that are further apart are, are more dissimilar. And so I tested six different tree species here. And as you can see, um, they cluster quite tightly together, meaning that um, this phenolic profiles were very unique to that species. However, we also see some overlap in the case of oak and beech. And so then out of those, um, out of, I tried to test a subset of these phenolic compounds um, and tested their effect on soil microbial respiration. And I tried to choose compounds that belong to the different chemical classes that I had identified. Um, and so here you see those chemicals on the axes and then the amount of CO2 that was respired over a five day period. And I included glucose as a positive control. And then you see the control um, that didn't uh, receive any phenolic addition in the middle, in dark blue. Um, and so what I want you to take away from this graph is that you can see that phenolic compounds can both increase, decrease, or have no effect on soil microbial respiration. So this goes already against this most common hypothesis, com common hypothesis or common mechanism that has been proposed to explain root priming. Um, then an additional thing that, that I found was very interesting when looking at these results is that it seems that uh, the biosynthetic class that the compound belongs to is not determining whether this compound is gonna have a negative, a positive, or no effect on respiration. So as you can see, there's three flavonoid compounds in this graph, and there are, um, they can, naringenin is increasing respiration, while taxifolin and catagen are decreasing respiration. And then additionally, if you uh, look at the compounds that suppressed respiration, so those are the ones in red, they, did sh they all shared the same functional group, uh, category group. And so 
this supports the hypothesis that maybe functional group of the compound is more important in determining the compound's effect on soil microbial respiration than the biosynthetic class. And so for the, my next study, I want you to remember uh, these three compounds, so benzoic acid that increased respiration and then caffeic acid and catechin that decreased respiration because I will, I, I, I'm going to further study them in my next experiment. So overall, from, from this first experiment, I can conclude that roots exude a large variety of phenolic compounds and that these phenolic profiles are quite unique to one species and that these compounds can result in a variety of effects on soil microbial respiration. However, there are also still um, a lot of unknowns or some unknowns that I was specifically interested in. And the first was, well, okay, so we have this total flux of CO2 coming from the system, but what part of this flux is coming or what, uh, which part of this carbon is coming from the exudate or which, carbon, which part of the carbon came from, from the soil? Then also, I still don't know really how these microbials responded to, to the exudates that were added. And so what the mechanism really was by which they degraded more or less soil carbon. Um, and then lastly, and this is, this is uh, just in general a problem with, with studying the effect of root exudates in the way that I did and that other studies did, is that we're always just adding one compound to the soil while roots exude so many compounds at the same time. So whether the individual fact of one root exudate is going to be the same when there's a bunch of compounds added is also still an open question. So for this second experiment, I, I collaborated with a lot of people to, to answer these, these remaining questions. And I first want to thank Juana Munoz Ucros. Um, if it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't have included a sequencing component into this study. So thank you for all your help and support. Um, and I also want to thank Jet Sparks, which uh, helped me a lot with uh, figuring out the methods to measure, uh, to use stable isotope analyses to distinguish between the soil and exudate source of carbon. Um, and I also want to thank Kim Sparks and just COIL in general. Then I also want to thank Kyle Wickens, um, who helped me with the design of the experiment, um, enzyme analysis, microbial biomass. I also want to thank his graduate student, Natalie Bray, because she was the one who teached me or showed me how to use the TOC machine. So thanks a lot for that. And then lastly, I want to thank Roly, who, uh, Roland Wilhelm from the Buckley Lab, who helped uh, further supported me and Juana with the sequencing part of the study. All right, so this soil exudate incubation was similar to, to the incubation that I did in the previous study, only that this incubation took longer, so it was 38 days in total, and that I used um, uh, 13C labeled compounds so that I was able to distinguish between carbon coming from the soil and carbon coming from the exudates. And uh, I used two different methods to measure soil respiration. I still use my KOH or KOH traps to get an estimate of the total amount or cumulative amount of carbon respired over the course of the experiment. But I also, um, on several days, on day one, day two, day five, day 15, and the last day of the experiment, I also took uh, two hour interval gas samples. And then by, through using Keeling plots, um, I could estimate the delta 13C signature of the source of carbon being respired. And then also um, to get more of this uh, microbial mechanism that, was, that was, could maybe explain part of these patterns that we were seeing, I took destructive samples on day five, day 15, and at the end for um, the enzyme analysis, for microbial biomass, microbial abundance, and then also for the sequencing part, or the co microbial community analysis of the study. Oh, yeah, and then the last thing that, that I want to mention um, about, um, or that was different from the last study, is that I introduced glucose into the story. And I chose glucose because that's the compound that has been most widely studied. And um, I wanted to see if, um, its effect would be the same when a compound, a phenolic compound was added at the same time that, that, that I already showed has these different effects on soil microbial respiration. Um, so I had treatments where I added just the phenolic, I added the glucose, or I added the phenolic and glucose together. And in the cases where there was just a single compound, those were, so the phenolic was labeled or the glucose was labeled, but in the case where I added both compounds, 
the glucose was labeled. So um, I couldn't, I didn't have a, a way, well, um, so I could distinguish between the carbon coming from the glucose and from the formulaic and the soil together. Um, I did estimate the amount of carbon that came from the soil by subtracting the amount of phenolic compound degraded in the individual treatment. All right, so here are the chemicals that I already introduced from my previous study. Um, so I, I tested the effect of benzoic acid, caffeic acid, and catagen um, at a high and a low dose. Then glucose, and so then I ended up with 14 treatments in total. And then with the structure samples that I was taking at these different time points, I ended up with uh, a lot of charts uh, in, a, in a growth chamber at Guterman. And um, so yeah, a lot of jars and also a lot of results. So that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, for the sake of this talk, I'm gonna focus on these three points that I already mentioned um, that I was interested in um, learning more about. And if you wanna learn even more about it, then well, maybe tomorrow we can talk about it more. All right, so um, this first question of where, where uh, to what extent are these root exudates actually degraded? Um, so I'm showing you a graph here of uh, the degradation of the individual treatments or the individual compounds over the first 15 days of the experiment. And so um, you can see, um, first let's look at glucose. So that's the black line. Um, and so you can see that on day one, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's, it's the greatest to the highest degree. And then it already very quickly drops. And by day 15, it's, it's similar to the... Um, it's, it's not being degraded much anymore. Um, and then for benzoic acid, um, we do see some degradation, which is just a little slower. Um, but this, this, goes, this goes against my hypothesis that these um, phenolics aren't degraded at all. So they are utilized. Um, but then if you look at caffeic acid and catagen, they are almost not degraded or not degraded. Um, so that is in line with what I, with what I hypothesized. Then if we look at um, the amount of carbon that is respired from the soil, so this is over the 38 days of the experiment, um, we see that only, so the control here is in gray, and we see that uh, only glucose increases decomposition, uh, soil organic matter decomposition, and benzoic acid at the high dose. And so because I only picked up on this effect for, um, or a difference, in soil organic matter decomposition for benzoic acid and glucose. I'm gonna show you um, a graph of just those two treatments. So this is the same as, as what I showed you in the previous graph. Um, but then what I was interested in is this interactive effect of benzoic acid and glucose on the breakdown of uh, soil organic carbon. And so what we see is that when they're added together, um, the amount of soil organic matter that is decomposed is decreased, is increased. And um, this is actually more than if you would just add the, their effects of the individual treatments. And we can use um, enzyme analysis to get a better idea of what kind of uh, carbon sources were degraded. And so I found no difference in phenol oxidase or peroxidase activity, but I did find a big increase in, in, in beta glucosidase activity in the benzoic acid treatment and in the benzo benzoic acid and glucose treatments, which suggests that the carbon sources that were utilized uh, were on the more label side and not um, very complex or aromatic. And so then for the the microbial mechanisms that I was interested in studying, I just wanted to quickly elaborate on that before moving into the results. So the question that I was interested in is, to what extent a change in microbial respiration is linked to uh, an increase or decrease in microbial abundance or um, microbial community or both? So you can imagine your control where um, no phenolic compound is added. And then if you do add a phenolic compound, but we don't see an, a change in abundance and we don't see a change 
in the community, then maybe the mechanism involved is triggering mechanism. So the metabolism of the microbes that are living in that soil is triggered. And that's the reason why we see, in this case, I'm using an increase in, um, in respiration as, as my example, but you could um, argue it. You could argue the same thing for a decrease in respiration. Um, or if we don't see a change in the community, but we do see a change in abundance, then uh, maybe it's this increase in microbial biomass that, that um, is linked with this increase in respiration. Or if we don't see a increase in abundance, but we do see an increase in, or, or do see a shift in the community, then maybe it's this change in the community that is linked to, to a change in respiration. So a community that is uh, maybe more actively um, uh, degrading carbon resources, or even maybe a community that, that consists of more uh, degraders of soil organic carbon. So I'll start with showing you um, a graph of microbial abundance as affected by the different phenolic treatments. And so we have uh, benzoic acid, caffeic acid, and catechin, and the control. And we see that even though benzoic acid increased microbial respiration overall, um, its, its abundance is not increased. And then if we look at caffeic acid and cadogan, uh, we do see a decrease in abundance. And these treatments were also the one that were showing more of a decrease in respiration. So maybe in this case, abundance could explain part of this story, but not in the case of benzoic acid. And so here are, are my microbial community results. Um, and so this is a similar plot that I showed as to the one with the root exudate um, variation among three species. So again, like points that are closer together are more similar and then points that are further apart are more, uh, are, are more different. And well, the first thing that, um, so these are samples taken at day, five, day 0, 5, 15, 38. Um, so the first thing that stands out is that the microbial community changed over time because we see this, we see this uh, shift um, with the days, or days are grouped together. Um, but then the thing that, that I was more interested in seeing is what these phenolic compounds were doing to the community. And so you can see that benzoic acid, so those are the data points in blue, are very far shifted away from the control that is in gray. Though if you look at glucose, which is in black, it's very uh, closely grouped together to this control, especially on, on day five. So this suggests that even though glucose and benzoic acid were both increasing respiration, that maybe the mechanism by which they did this was different. And so for, so overall, like with these two graphs, it, um, I've already tested the effect of phenolic compounds on abundance and on the microbial community. But we can further test this by uh, using um, Spearman correlations. And the, the unit that I used here for the shift in microbial community is that I calculated the distance from these individual data points to the control. So that is kind of my measure for the shift in, com in the community that took place. And so then we find, if you look at, at graph A, um, that there was a significant correlation between the shift in the community and the change in microbial respiration. While if we look at the second graph, graph B, then we do not see a correlation between microbial abundance and microbial respiration. And so then the next question was, Okay, so we see a shift in the community, but what is really changing or who is changing? And um, we found that um, in the benzoic acid treatment, the Burkholderia and Paraburkholderia genera, uh, which ecologically are kind of still treated as the same genus, even though phylogenetically they have been separated um, recently, um, that they were the ones that showed the greatest increase in, uh, in abundance under the, under the benzoic acid treatment. And this, these genera um, are known to be prevalent in forest soils, which was um, the soil that I used for both incubation studies. Um, and they're also known to be able to degrade phenolics quite efficiently and also be able to tolerate their toxicity. 
Um, and at the same time, they also play a role um, in soil organic matter decomposition. So then we can start seeing that this mechanism that maybe with the addition of benzoic acid, we selected for a micro microbial genera that, um, that could tolerate, to, that could degrade these compounds, that could tolerate potential toxicity, but that were also quite efficient at breaking down uh, soil organic matter. So even though benzoic acid um, also was used as a food source um, and also increased respiration, um, I think that, that the mechanism by which it was done was different. Maybe it caused a change in the microbial community and that was what um, was more linked to this uh, change in uh, respiration. So then to bring it back to my overall hypothesis that I was testing in these two experiments. So is it, are phenolics used as a microbial food source? Well, yes, in the case of benzoic acid, no in the case of, uh, of cadogan and caffeic acid or to a lesser degree. Um, but the mechanism um, by which this food source was um, in the end causing also a change in organic matter decomposition was different. It was, it was changing the community. And so other phenolic mechanisms that maybe I, that I found some evidence for were toxicity in the case of caffeic acid and cadigan, because we saw this decrease in, the, in abundance. Um, and there, there's other mechanisms that I did that my results don't exclude, but that we would need further evidence for to, to, um, to support them. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so I shared my results today. Um, one about the responses of fine roots to drought. And uh, then secondly, the mechanisms by which root exudates can influence soil organic matter decomposition. And so I answered some questions, but there's still a lot of remaining questions. It's a, it's a very complex system to study, uh, but I hope that uh, you agree with me that um, answering these remaining questions is, is worth the struggle. And so with that, I want to thank many people. First of all, my major advisor, Karen Bowerly. Thanks so much for all your support. Um, I've really, yeah, I've really enjoyed working with you and very much appreciated the freedom and confidence and tools you gave me to develop my dissertation project. So thanks so much. Then I'd also like to thank um, the rest of my committee, Tim, Andre, Jed, and Kyle. It's been really a pleasure to work with all of you and um, yeah, I've learned a lot from you and I'm very grateful for um, discussing my results with you. Um, manuscript revisions help with research methods. So thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm just gonna keep on going. <laughs> um, I would like to thank all the members of the Bowerly Lab, um, Juana, well, who was also a collaborator and Annika and all the undergraduates that helped me, lab technicians as well. I um, also like to thank my other collaborators, Mark Kobol, Thorsten Grant, Karen Fritz, um, that were involved in the Germany study, then uh, Juana and Roli. Then also, Cornell's just great for, they had so many facilities and um, uh, the technical help and support that uh, analytical support I've received has just been amazing. So I want to thank everyone there. And then the, just the wider SIPS community, Johannes, my master's advisors, and Bob Surgeon, who I TA'd for for many years, and Soho and the horticulture staff, and also my funding sources. And lastly, um, my family and friends have been, yeah, just wonderful. And I really don't know how I would have done it without all of you, especially my friends here in Ithaca and my boyfriend, who is now with me in France. So yeah, thank you all. Time for questions. Yeah. Hi. Very much. Great. Um, I had a question to the first uh, section. Yeah. You mentioned that your hypothesis was confirmed about resource use efficiency and complementary yeah. um, root distribution. Yeah. Although you know, it's a hypothesis because you, I guess you didn't measure root distribution. No. Do you have some above ground measurements that that um, really it did uh, the 
complementarity did not decrease CO2 uptake yeah. during drought and did indeed also increase growth above ground? Yes, um, so other collaborators that's, that were that are part of this study are measuring the above ground, um, above ground parameters. Um, and um, well, we found that drought is decreasing carbon uptake. Um, and in terms of the complementary part, they haven't found, well, they haven't published their results yet and their results aren't super convincing, um, but there are some, there are some uh, increases or not increases. It seems like it is the effect of drought is slightly mitigated, but um, it isn't super convincing. Yeah, and they have there. Um, there's other part of the study is that there is this. So there's this one big controlled fruit fill exclusion site, and then there's also a larger gradient of precipitation gradient where they're looking at um, well mainly above ground parameters as well. And in some of these studies, they have found this complementary effect above ground, but not at the Kranzberg site where I was working, yeah. So in whatever it is, it could be interesting, right? Yeah, I think so. It would be more interesting if above ground there's no difference, no mitigation um, yeah. of the drought effect here due to uh, mixed mixed systems and, and you find one True. would be actually more interesting. Yeah, maybe. I guess let's hope they find that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't find anything more. Well, I remember yeah. that so there must be there lots of mixtures spruce beach mixtures studies outside of the drug world. Yeah. Haven't those, have those found consistent mixture effects? Um, not, not completely, not completely um, consistent, but there are studies that show that there is a complementary effect and that there is um, greater growth, yeah. Yeah. So this was a few meters, so like maybe two, three meters. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how a root will? I don't even know how to ask this question. Or how a tree modifies anatomically those fine roots so that they live longer? Do you know how that lifespan is controlled? <sighs> Mm, no, no, I don't. Um, no, I don't. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's. I guess I can all as I can say they try to maintain the root for longer, but because um, it's like it's kind of this question of are you gonna are you gonna use um, are you gonna shed your root or are you just are you gonna maintain it for longer and just keep on sending resources its way. Um, but if there's something anatomically that changes so that you have like a super root that can live a little longer, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Did Alex's results uh, inform that? Didn't he do stuff on carbon depletion? Um, yeah, so Alex's results um, in terms of the lifespan or the... Lifespan. Yeah, so he, he found the relationship between lifespan and respiration. Um, so that I think the roots with longer lifespan had lower respiration rates. Um, yeah. So. All right. Good. Yeah. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>